Hi, I'm Andy Anderson, and today I'm here with Jamie McIntyre, best-selling author, educator, self-made millionaire, and today we're going to be talking about success psychology, what changes Australians can make to improve their lives and small business, and about his massive event coming up when he's bringing Arnold Schwarzenegger out to inspire all of us. Jamie, welcome. Pleasure. You've got an incredible event coming up, and in the past you've had speakers like Tim Ferriss, Richard Branson, right. Jordan Belford, so big players, game changers, and now uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, so it's unbelievable. So what drives you to create such a, a massive reality, something like this? Well, as we've been to, I mean, 21st century education, as we started many years ago, um, ironically, I said my mum when I was at university, why isn't a university teach how to be successful in life? Yeah. Uh, so a decade later, I decided to create something to help create a, a modern day education system. And financial education is a big part of that. So the Financial Education Summit we started three years ago, as you mentioned, Richard Branson and, and the Wolf of Wall Street and, and Tim Ferriss and, and these people that have a PhD in results. So we're looking for anyone that has really delivered results. We can go to university and listen to theory, but what people really want, what counts in the real world is results. And I think Arnold Schwarzenegger is probably one of the greatest examples of someone that's produced results, not just in one career, but like in four careers. Mm, yeah. mm, so definitely. it's an amazing story. Yeah, true. So Arnold Schwarzenegger is a multimillionaire, businessman, political leader. He's done it all, really. Now, how do you make, how do you get someone that big to, to come to Australia and talk at one of your events? Well, I think we're lucky being in Australia that many of these uh, amazing people love to come to our country. So that, that definitely helps as well. But I mean, we're always looking for uh, people that really can you know, have a, people who will be inspired by it. And I know a lot of us, you know, especially uh, you know, as teenagers, we grew up and um, we seen Arnie on Conan the Barbarian yeah. and all these muscles popping out. With th that made me go to the gym and I'm sure countless others and, and it really did have an in impact in our life. Yeah. Um, so it's really about, I mean, Arnie loves to speak. Uh, he loves sharing his story, loves helping people. So I think that was an attraction for him. And also, you know, he, he was in Australia in 1980 uh, mm. when he won. He would come out of retirement to win the seventh uh, time uh, Mr. Olympia. Yeah. Um, so for him, he has fond memories of, of Australia. So he's happy to come back and, and be here. Oh, that's great. It's very, very exciting. So did Arnie have a big impact on, on your life at all when you were younger? I think, yeah, when I was younger. I mean, a lot of people don't realize back in the 70s, I mean, Arnie talks about this even in his book, is that there was maybe only one or two gyms in an entire large city. Mm. Today, mm. there's gyms on every corner. Yeah. Like, we just take it for granted people go to the gyms. But yeah. people don't recognize that Arnie really created that movement. I mean, he not only dominated an industry in bodybuilding, mm. he created the industry and then created a bigger industry of people going to gyms and how many gym chains is there today where people just natural part of their life, they go and work out. Mm. Um, so he had that big impact on me. I was, grew up playing rugby league and obviously working out and, and inspired that. But even recently, like reading uh, Arnie's story, I mm. said to a lot of my friends, I said, uh, as far as his book Total Recall, mm. I've never probably read a book that's made as much impact on my life and never learned as much from because wow. his story, a lot of people don't realise what he's had to do to achieve success in four industries, not just one. Yeah, yeah, very big. So uh, can you fill us in on a little bit, what will I be talking about? What will he be teaching us? Well, he's going he's gonna to share his story, obviously, and mm. obviously starting off with the bodybuilding and how he dominated the industry and become a champion in that. But Arnie is an embodiment of what we teach at 21st century. In other words, you need to set goals. I mean, people don't realise Arnie had a 15-year master plan. Yeah. Like, he set a goal in 15 years and said that when he's a scrawny kid growing up mm. in a small town in Austria, yeah. that he's going to become a bodybuilding champion. Mm. And that's going to be his ticket to America, the land of opportunity. Mm. And then when he gets to America, he's become, going to become the highest paid movie star. That was his 15-year plan. Now, mm. kids have big dreams, but to actually put that down in writing mm. and then mm. follow it through and execute and achieve it. Then he married a Kennedy and then he became the governor of the, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the seventh largest economy on the planet. Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible story. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't happen through luck. And, mm. and you and I know, and people that are successful want to be successful. No, it's not luck that mm. plays its part. I mean, it may have some part of it, but there's a lot more to it than that. So he's going to be teaching you know, the power of goal setting, the power of self-education. He had to teach himself English. Mm. He, you know, to, he had to educate himself relentlessly. A lot of people don't realise he'd become a millionaire through real estate investing in America before he made his big money in Hollywood. Wow, yeah. So he's going to be teaching, you know, investing, self-education, what it takes to be successful, having that master plan, intent mm. and vision. So he, he's a walking, breathing example of what it takes to make your dreams a reality. Yeah, wow. Looking forward to it. It's going to be massive. Great. So what are the other highlights of the event? 
Well, the events are a full one-day event, so it's mm. not just Arnie, but we uh, we have some amazing other speakers. Well, Danny Green, you know, four-time right. champion Australian boxer. Uh, Danny's an amazing guy and mm. quite articulate. Like you know, and people don't realize like boxing is a business. Mm. It's not mm. just the you know being good in the ring. Yeah. Uh, Danny shares a story how at one point he had to mortgage his whole house that if he lost the fight, he would not just lost the fight, he would have lost his entire house. I wow. mean, he's an amazing story. So we have other people, Nick Halleck, who's uh, you know, climb top of Mount Everest, he's been into space, uh, been down the deck of Titanic, uh, so inspiring people like that, uh, mm. and a whole host of other speakers. Mm. Wow, very exciting, Jamie. So, yeah, I know when I went to the last event, it really inspired me to sort of push forward, and I think that's what everyone's going to get out of it, and hearing the stories, and being able to utilise this to really motivate them to achieve some really amazing things, so it's really cool. Now, you've got a great story yourself, um, and like I just said, it, it inspired me to um, raise capital and do some big things with my business. So can you tell us about your rags to riches story and, and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, sure. It's, it's quite a journey now, but uh, you know, when I was, uh, I left school, I quit university, went to, to university, I quit after a year uh, studying accountancy. I was like mm -hmm. most people, didn't know what I wanted to do. And my careers advisor at school said, Jamie, you want to make lots of money? You should go and be an accountant. Mm. And my, I actually have an accounting company now, despite I know my group of companies, despite failing in accounting. So um, then I started the business. I moved to Sydney. I grew up in a small country town called Glen Ennis in northern New South Wales, about six mm. hours above Sydney. And moving to a big city was quite a challenge. You know, when you're a country boy and to go to a big city, I started my first company was in telecommunications, a young age. Because um, I thought by the year 2000, this was in the early 90s, the year 2000, mm. everyone had a mobile phone. Now, obviously, it was critical. I got in with a trend that was growing. And these days, of course, everyone has a mobile phone. Um, so I made some good money, but then I ended up losing it and because I realized I was never taught at school how to manage money. I was never taught how to be an entrepreneur at school. Mm -hmm. I was never taught any of these skills. Mm -hmm. And um, so I didn't know how to manage, how to grow a company, how to do anything. So I was ended up being almost bankrupt, mm -hmm. $150,000 in debt. And I had two choices, either you leave Sydney and go back and become a farmer, and uh, I didn't want to be a farmer, so all I had to go, I had to turn this mess around. I've got to somehow uh, turn this mess around. So I virtually almost bankrupt. I managed to turn that around. But the turning point was I decided, you know what, I needed to get an education. Mm. I was not taught at school the things I needed to learn. And I decided if I want to produce results in my life, I need to find someone and model them. And one of the first things, I found a mentor, a millionaire mentor in Sydney. I went and worked for him. Mm -hmm. And I he had a PhD in results. And I learned what it took to be successful as an investor, successful in business, successful with the mindset, mm -hmm. and completely transformed my life. Within less than five years, in my 20s, I become a self-made millionaire. Mm -hmm. um, and I look back and go, you know what, that, that wasn't easy to do. I'm not saying it's easy, but massive shift in what I was doing, strategy and mindset and mentors. Same thing Arnie talks about. He had mentors, yeah. role models written down goals, mm. and a strategic plan that was likely to succeed if you put effort in. Mm. And that's what I developed and it turned my life around. Brilliant. Amazing. So coming back from 150k in debt, yep. most people would be a daunting thought, yeah? They'd be quite scared about that. Can you tell me about the mindset shift that you had from being someone in debt, down and out, and crawling back to the top? Yeah, I think it's, you've got to like let go of your fear. I mean, a lot of people afraid, what if you go bankrupt or what if you go broke? Mm. Well, you know, when you're young and you really don't have that much money, it's funny how we're like, why would we lose everything? Well, I didn't have much to lose anyhow. I mean, yeah. we've got to let go of the fear of faith. The ironic thing is mm. the reason I get to live my dreams today and had incredible success, well beyond my, what I ever expected, was because I failed at a young age. And my mentor, he helped me change my thinking. He said, like, I want you to list down all your assets and liabilities. Mm. This is when I was like sleeping on a friend's couch, $150,000 in debt. Yeah. And I said, well, that one, that, um, it won't take me long to listen to my assets. I don't have any. Mm. He goes, that's your problem, Jamie. You don't have any assets. I'm like, no shit, Dick Tracy. You know, of course. <laughs> he goes, you're not. You don't understand. You think you have no assets, and that's what your challenge is. Yeah. He said, look, you're young. You're 21. Mm. How many people want to be 21? I mean, youth is power. Mm. He said, you can mm. speak English, right? I said, sort of. I grew up in the country, yeah. uh, sort of. So he said, you're young. You're, you're healthy. Mm. You live in Australia. Mm. He said, you have, and you've managed to get in this much debt, if you can manage to get yourself in that much debt at that age, then you mm. have something going for you, you can manage to get yourself out of it. Yeah. So he listed everything, he said, you have everything you need to be successful. Mm. The only thing holding you back is yourself. Mm. And when I had that mindset shift to stop being sorry for myself, stop blaming my business partner, who 
goes, you know, or blame him for why the business failed or having excuses why I couldn't do something, I didn't have any money. He said, you know, you can, you can either make excuses or make money, you can't make, do both. So mm. make up your mind what you want to do. Yeah. So he was quite firm and hard on me and that was a turning point. To get myself up off my butt and have a go and stop whinging or whining or thinking like it's difficult, it's impossible mm. uh, and get on with it. Yeah, great, amazing story. So can you tell us a little bit about what's at the core of what makes you tick? Why do you get up every morning and want to change people's lives with education and, and everything that you do? Yeah, it's a good question. So for me, I'm fortunate. I don't ha I'm just naturally driven, so I don't have to like motivate myself mm. to do anything. I think that the key is what turned my life around is tapping into what was my purpose. And what I realized that once I turned my life around and what I learned from my millionaire mentor and other uh, mentors was that everything I learned to become successful, I could have actually been taught at school. Mm. It was common sense, it was strategic, intelligent thinking. I'm thinking, why weren't we taught these things at school? I would have avoided the pain of almost going bankrupt. And I, so I started sharing what I did with other people and they loved it and people, and I turned into a career of speaking, accident, yeah. totally by accident. Mm. People used to want to hear my story and more and more people found out and uh, so I used to become an educator by default. Mm. Um, so what drives me, I realise you know, the best way that I can help change the world and what the world really needs is a modern day 21st century education system. The education system we got at school was designed in the 19th century, industrialization era, and here we are in the 21st century with a, an education system that's hopelessly outdated, mm. that doesn't teach people what they need to know, um, and that's the challenge. So I'm driven for two things, to change the world's education system and to change the world's political systems. That's amazing, yeah, and I completely agree uh, with that statement with the education system. Do you see it changing anytime soon? I think it's going to be a long journey. I mean, I, I'm realistic about it, but I'm dedicating my life to it. So I, you know, we're making progress. I mean, we've educated the 21st century now over 550,000 people from 17 different countries. Wow. Uh, I'm speaking to many you know, people that can help, that believe in this cause. Richard Branson's a big believer that especially yeah. business education, entrepreneurship should be taught at school. Yes. Uh, Tim Ferriss is, Tony Robbins, Robert Kiyosaki. I spoke to Steve Wozniak, Apple co-founder, and he's mm -hmm. equally passionate about this change. He, you know, he believes with technology now, uh, we can change where computers like Siri, like on the iPhone, etc., can be adapted to, be te to teach people uh, teach students to be like a teacher. So mm. with technology, Google, Facebook are very open to it. So I think now as we're getting more of these leaders together and go, mm. how do we revolutionize the world's education system? There's no greater way to change the world than to be able to do that. Wow, and do you make it a point to talk to all these people about the situation? Yeah, but yeah definitely. And we're putting a global think tank together of many of these people. Mm. And I'm hoping to speak to Oprah as well about it because she's one of the most influential people yes. to say, you know, what do we have to do to put our a network of people together to really make this happen. That's at the top level. Then you mm. want to start at grassroots level where with the applications that are being created through alpha apps and iPads, iPad alone is changing the education mm. system because kids are now engaged. They want to learn off this. So mm. I think we're at the point now where most people agree. Who's going to argue and say, yes, we shouldn't be taught these things at school. Should, mm. We definitely should be. Mm. And now's the time to start delivering a real life education so when kids leave school, they're well prepared for the future. Yeah, brilliant, Jamie. Awesome. Now, Jamie, let's talk a little bit about business in Australia. And obviously, yep. you're very passionate about politics and Australia in general. Mm. What do you think that business owners, small business owners, need in this dog eat dog economy to succeed? Well, I think a few things. I mean, it, is, it can be a challenging environment out there. There's a lot of uncertainty in Australia. But the challenge we have in Australia, even though one of the top performing economies in the world, we, um, we're quite pessimistic. Mm. You know, we escape yeah. the worst of the credit crisis. Um, but we're still pessimistic. So where in Europe they have good reason to be pessimistic, in Australia we really don't. So I think it's more of a mindset thing. It's also with the, you know, the dog eat dog economy. It's a way that we view it. Mm. I used to look at it that way, but in business I understood that the world, there's two economic models for the world. One is you believe in scarcity, what we're taught at school, economics, the study of scarce resources, or the abundance model where there's, you know, there's unlimited abundance in the world. Yeah. I changed my mindset to see unlimited abundance in the world. So. There's a lot of money in the world. There's mm. more money. There's not a lack. You know, there's not a lack. People have lack of money not because there is a lack of money. It's just like there's people starving in the planet. It's not because yes. there's not enough food. There's mm. ample food for everyone. Mm. Mm. It's a distribution access to that. Yeah. So people got to under realize there's wealth being created at a magnificent rate, an ever expanding rate. So there's lots of money there in the economy. Mm. So small businesses don't have as much as they want. They've got to understand they don't have the right strategy and they don't have the right mindset. Yeah. By changing the mindset alone to realize there's all this money in abundance around them, they're going to tap into more of that. Then they've got to look at their strategy. Mm. Is their strategy working? And most people are fo following strategies for what everyone else is doing. Mm. 
And if you do what the average person does, you'll produce the result of the average person. Yeah, definitely. So would you say the small business in Australia is in a good position right now to to make a lot of money and really improve well, the situation? Well, I think, I abs I think any time is good. If you have mm. the right thinking, any time is. I'm not yeah. saying it's easy, but the reality is some of the greatest companies were built in uh, the D Great Depression. Yeah. Uh, recessionary environments, you can many success stories come out of it. Mm. We're not in those environments right now. We're in a time of uncertainty with some political uncertainty, um, but we've got to let go of what we can't control and focus on what we do control. So I'm not saying it's easy as a small business. You know, I, you know, I have a dozen companies, so I'm in yeah. I'm in the coal face. So like I know what it's like managing yeah. companies and growing companies, but you have to be. Uh, thinking you know, outside the box. And the key is shortcut to success is very simple. Mm -hmm. And all small businesses should do this. Mm -hmm. You need a role model. Yeah. Anything you want to do has already been done before or something mm -hmm. similar. Get a model mm -hmm. and then you basically do what the Chinese do. You copy. Yeah. Okay? School were taught not to copy. Yeah. In the 21st century, you should copy. Yeah. Okay? But we call it modeling. Yeah. Okay? You model success. You find a model that's working and you, it's no point reinventing the wheel. The wheel's been invented. Go to and make the wheel a better, faster wheel. Yeah. That's how society evolves. Don't go and try and redesign another wheel. Someone's mm. already done it, so let's make it a better wheel. Yeah. That's what business has to look at doing. Great advice. Often on stage, you're talking about psychology mm. and success psychology is 80% of business success. Can you just expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, it's all about changing your thinking. A lot of people don't quite get it because it's like, here's how it was for me. When I was first um, learning off my me and a mentor, yeah. I was impatient. 21, you know, I need to rapidly make some money to pay the rent. Um, so I was too impatient. He said, you know, I was just like, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He told me I should read some books. I should look mm. at changing my thinking, develop mm. my mindset, my psychology. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've read all the books I used to say, just show me the money. Yeah. Okay. I just show me the strategy is going to make me the money fast. Yeah. And that was part of the challenge. I was mm. trying to get rich quick. Mm. And one of the reasons my first business failed is that I was in it purely for money. Mm. So I'm telling you now, if people, the, the most financially successful people on the planet mm. are the people that do what they do because they have a higher purpose or have passion behind it. Yeah. Donald Trump, I mean, he's a multi-billionaire. Mm. He, is he passionate about building the best buildings or is he happy just to slap a building together and make a quick buck? I mean, it has Trump on a building, you know it's high quality. Yeah. He is passionate about that. He's going to build the best. And that's mm. why the Trump brand gets a 20 30% premium if it has that name on the building. Mm -hmm. So he's successful because he's passionate and delivers a higher set. Richard Branson, does he have to be motivated to go to work? No, he's passionate about what he does. Mm. Oprah Winfrey, she's passionate. She's a billionaire because she believes in what she's doing. She has a higher purpose. So businesses have to tap into what is your higher purpose. Mm. A business should be an extension of who you are. So the psychology comes from that also. So you realize that by changing your thinking, like do millionaires think differently to pensioners? Of mm, course. So what, yeah. what is that thinking? So there's a, you can actually break down to what that thinking is, but 80% is changing that thinking. If all people do is change their thinking and modeled and thought like a millionaire or billionaire, they would start to find by acting and thinking differently, mm. the results will start to show up differently. Then you've got to combine, you can't just have change the psychology, you've got to have the mechanics, the mm. actual strategy, which is the 20%. The 20% anyone can go and learn. Mm. But if you only get the 20% of the mechanics but you don't change the thinking, then you'll fail to implement and execute yeah. the strategies and the ideas. So that's why it's critical. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. So you're talking about all these inspirational people. And obviously, you're always rubbing shoulders with these guys. Who would be the most inspirational person you've ever met and dealt with and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Obviously, my first me and our mentor was just a private person. Mm. So he had an impact on me. Um, Tony Robbins was someone that's had a big influence on in my life. Mm. I, I learned public speaking through Tony. I learned how to become emotionally intelligent and really change the psychology. Mm. Um, so he, he's been a big influence. Um, Sir Richard Branson, I think in business, even before I met Richard, you know, five or six years ago, mm. you know, I'd studied his books, etc. So I'd already adopted some of his thinking. So. Mm. Um, you know, learning off Richards made me tens of tens of millions of dollars more just in business. So mm. uh, he, he, I think he's been inspiring as far as having a work-life balance. Like you should, your business should be fun. Yeah. And I've learned to make my business and my career fun and enjoy it. Uh, he still thinks there should not be no li line between play and work. Mm. You should enjoy mm. your life, and especially we spend so much time at work. So he was a big impact. Um, and there's been, you know, other people like Napoleon Hill as far as reading his books and stuff, Think and Grow Rich. Mm. Um, those things were very impactful. So quite a few people. Brilliant. Jamie, you meet lots of millionaires, you meet lots of billionaires. We've just been talking about the difference in mindset between these people. Now, when you're at the scale of millionaire and billionaire, mm. is there a difference between these two, you know, sectors in mindset? 
there actually is. It's quite interesting. Like yeah. for me, um, when I first wanted to become a millionaire, the key mm. was to go and find a millionaire mentor and mm. a role model. Uh, and that helped me become a millionaire. And then was a millionaire. So if I want to play, go to the next level, you know, um, I need to start hanging around billionaires. Mm. And I put that intention out there. And, and this is maybe six, seven years ago. And I never met a billionaire up until that time. Within 12 months, I met five billionaires. Wow. So, you know, personally, some famous people, obviously like Richard Branson, but other people are just private billionaires. So I think when you put the intention, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. We mm. often hear that. But they're saying, what is the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire? And they're saying the only, some, some university studies have found the only um, actual difference they could find is that um, billionaires check their goals daily and mm. millionaires only weekly. Wow. And that was the only defining difference yeah. between the two levels of success. And you could take that one level down, the people that don't even achieve millionaire status are generally people that don't have goals, mm. or they do, the only time they set them, as we know, is New Year's Eve. Yeah, yeah. And the only time they check in on how they're going is next New Year's Eve. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. So that's the challenge for most people. They don't have written down goals. Great, so start goal setting, guys. Definitely very, very important. Now, looking at all the companies that you have, you've got over 100 people working for you, lots more. Now, what's your number one management strategy to drive all these people to achieve great things daily? Yeah, so I think it's a good question, and it's not easy in business, and mm. I've had to learn the hard way. I think there's probably two things. One, talking about purpose. If you're doing what you're doing because you have a higher purpose, a higher calling, like in 21st century, the people that work for us are enrolled in the vision. We want to change the world. We're not here just for a day-to-day -day business. We are out to change the world, change the world's education system. So there's a higher calling, so people are tapping that. You attract people that really want to make a difference in their life. That's a big part of it. The second thing is culture which I learned from Richard Branson, is that you want to create a culture and you should hire predominantly people that will fit into the culture. Mm. The only challenge, you know, you're hiring the wrong person is probably the biggest mistake businesses make. Mm. And recruitment is not easy in training. If you require to hire the wrong person, you can destroy your companies. Mm. And that's cost me a lot to learn that lesson. Um, my first mentor said, be uh, quick to fire and slow to hire. Mm. And I could never understand when I was first learning out what he meant by that. But when you have businesses and lots of staff, you realize that be slow to hire and quick to fire. Uh, the point is you want to hire, you want a culture in your company where people, they want to love what they do. Mm. And at Virgin, you look at Virgin, yeah. Virgin staff are generally happier, they'll work for a lot less money mm. because people predominantly don't want to work just for money. Money's not the main driver. Mm. If they love what they do and they believe in it, they'll work harder and they'll be better employees. So if you create that culture where people want to be a part of it, mm. I think that's the biggest key for a successful company. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, very valuable. Right, so Jamie, you're obviously very passionate about politics, again, like I said, in Australia. Now, if you were running the country, what's some of the big changes you'd make to improve Australia and uh, life for small business? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm an educator, so mm. um, I, I write a lot of books, and one of the books I wrote last year, which has been quite controversial, is 101 Ways to Improve Australia, mm. yeah. um, which was a non-profit aim, and I give that book away for free yeah. uh, because I'm really passionate about not you know, spending 15 years helping individuals change their financial circumstances, improve their life. It's, you just extrapolate that out for a country. It's the same thing, like you know, how to be successful. You spend less than you earn. You've got to learn to invest. You've got to innovate and create. Same thing for running a country. Mm. So mm. I'll, there's a lot of things that I would change. And one of the key things that I've said in my book is that uh, one, we change the political system where the power should be back in the hands of the voters. Voters should be able to vote direct on policy. Do we want a mining tax or a carbon tax? Let the voters with technology go and say yes or no and the majority should rule. Not where a, a politician can say, no, we're not going to have a carbon tax. Mm. Get elected and then change their mind. I mean, that deceives and annoys voters. So we should have the power, should be in the hands of the voters for major policy. We could vote on that. People be more empowered and they'd have more, people actually want to be involved in policy. Yeah. What they don't like is the politics mm. and the circus that we see. People don't like that. Mm. Uh, I would change or remove governments, the, the government spending from the hands of the government. Mm. We have mm. an independent reserve uh, bank board to set interest rates independently of the government and there's good reason for that. Yeah. We should have government spending independent of the government where there's an independent board assembled of the best business brains, the best financial yes. experts in the country or around the world mm. to oversee government spending because it's taxpayers money. It should be looked after. So it can't be misused for political purposes. Mm. Mm. That would make a big difference. As far as helping small business, you've got to have a government that's business friendly. Yeah. I mean, socialism and communism is not the key to prosperity. Mm. Um, it's sad in this country, there's some mm. people that believe in communism and mm. socialistic principles. They should go visit communistic countries yeah. 
stand in a bread queue mm. in a shop that has nothing there to sell other than a bit of bread mm. and live in mass poverty because that thinking creates poverty in a, in a country mm. and it creates poverty inside. So mm. pe- I've seen people with these views in this country and they're people that are generally broke, have no money in their life and their ideal way to get money is take it from rich people. Mm-hmm. That is a very sad way to look at life. We need rich people, we need wealth creators. So mm-hmm. you need a government that recognizes that business, small business and big business is the cornerstone. Mm-hmm. Governments don't create jobs, businesses create jobs. Yeah. They are the ones that create jobs. So if you do not look after and create an environment where the entrepreneurs are rewarded mm-hmm. to grow and to invest, to take risks, you don't have an economy. Yeah. So it's just being honest and being practical and recognizing that. If you take care of business, workers will automatically be taken care of. If you don't take care of business, there will not be jobs in the future because we live in a globalized world where companies are offshoring because you can hire people these days, you know, overseas for three, four, five, ten dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. In the US, the average person gets paid seven dollars an hour. The minimum wage in Australia is eighteen dollars an hour. So Australians employers have to deal with very high costs. So Australians got to understand, if you want to keep high salaries compared to the rest of the world, we need to upskill, mm. we need to perform more, and we need to be much more productive, much more efficient. Otherwise, we're going to lose. Yeah. And Australians are going to see their pays drop yeah. because companies can employ other people that can work harder mm. and they can do a better job. So we need to improve our skills. And top employees automatically improve their skills and they're the ones that do get pay rises. They don't need unions to get them a pay rise yeah. because the companies will give them more because if you produce more, a company will look after you. Mm, definitely, I agree. What are your big predictions for the next sort of five to 10 years with the Australian economy? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, we have a lot of challenges in the world. I'm very mm. bullish. America's recovering quite quickly. Europe's in all sorts of trouble. So mm. they've, what mm. they've done is printing money is just pushing the problem into the future. Mm. But in Australia, uh, if we have good fiscal management, we have a very good future. If we continue to do what we have been doing in our current government, then we don't have a very bright future. If you spend more than you earn, if you run up debt, mm. uh, you mismanage, if you upset and annoy uh, large companies and small businesses, that makes it harder for them to employ people, then you are going to ha- create problems. You're going to destroy wealth. Mm. We need to create wealth, not destroy wealth. Uh, and that's the critical thing. If we do that, and I think we have a lot of great opportunities in this country. We are a small population, a gigantic continent all to ourselves. Mm. We're loaded with resources. We are the lucky country. Mm. We just got to stop abusing that luck and, yeah. and work a little bit harder, a little bit mm. smarter mm. and manage our money better. Mm. Mm. So would you say that's one of the, the key differences? If, if we want to secure our position as one of the world leaders financially, what should the average Australian do to, to really aid that? Well, I'll give you an example. There used mm. to be a, a tiny country was a third world country, Mm. a poor country, Mm. not far from Australia. Today, that country is a leading financial country, a center in the world. Mm. It's a very rich country, one of the top performing economies in the world. And some people might be able to guess what that country that is, and that's Singapore. Singapore, four million people, Mm. a tiny island state, no natural resources. But they've invested heavily in quality education, Mm. uh, high savers, they're financially educated, they save a lot, they invest a lot, and they are smart. So they really work hard. As a result of that, Mm. they're able to outperform us. We are small population, gigantic natural resource. So we've been able to be a little bit lazy, a little bit blase. Mm. I see Australia a little bit like rich kids that inherit a lot of money. And they're a little bit take it for granted. Mm. We need to really uh, change that mindset and go, you know what, if we want to have our future generations enjoy this world, we just got to be a little bit smarter. So what individuals can do, get financially educated. Mm. The more you save, the more you invest, the richer you become, Mm. the richer our country collectively becomes. Creating wealth is a good thing and Mm. Australians need to get focused on that. Stop trying to get something for nothing. Mm. Stop believing politicians are going to take the money off the rich to give it to you for no effort. Mm. That is a lie, it's a false promise, it's communism, it will destroy economies and it's it's never gonna lead you the path to riches. You have to take charge if you wanna become wealthy and there's nothing wrong with becoming wealthy. You actually owe it to your country. If you live in a rich country, and you don't become financially successful, Mm. then I believe you have a moral obligation. If we live in this country, we have a moral obligation to do well to help those that are less fortunate. Mm. If we live in a rich country and we're lazy or don't take care of our finances, we are abusing the wonderful opportunity we've had. 
Give it up to someone else if you're not prepared to have a go, because there's plenty of people in the rest of the world that would do anything to come to this country and have the opportunity that Australians are born with. Mm. And that's why immigrants that move here are four times more likely to become self-made millionaires than Australians that are born here, because they're hungrier, mm. they're a different mindset, and they're prepared to have a go. Mm. I love that passion, it's great, excellent. So what do you think of the top Aussie companies right now crushing it, and why do you think they're crushing it at the moment? Well, obviously, modern, uh, commodity companies are doing well, and that's mm. because they've been riding on a trend. And uh, and Fortescue, I think, uh, has been a great example of a mining company that started with nothing, couldn't get capital in Australia, Australians mm. wouldn't back, had to go overseas, and Andrew Forrest has done a great job. But there's other companies like in retail. Retailers are complaining. I mean, that you know it's tough, and sure it is out there, but let's face it. Consumers are starting to not feel so much sorry for retailers because they can go on the internet and buy clothes from overseas, etc., mm. that are so cheap and go, hang on a minute, that means we've been overpaying for retail prices of clothes, etc., mm. for years because all the retail shop is they've bought it cheap, put it in a shop and sold it high price. Yeah. And now we can undercut that. So that I, I don't think people feel that empathetic towards them. So mm. retailers like Iconic, uh, Kogan.com, mm -hmm. you know, smart young entrepreneurs that are tapping into internet retailing, they're booming. And mm -hmm. they, you know, I, my former CEO, when he finished up a, a few years back, he come to me with a simple internet startup idea. Like many people smart, come up with an idea mm -hmm. and they want to, you want to make some money from it. Quick story, mm -hmm. he comes to me and said, Jamie, I'm starting this company, it's a, a, it's a internet company, and I'm modeling. See, first thing, he's modeling mm -hmm. a successful company. There's this company in America called Groupon. Now back, you know, three or four years ago, no one heard of Groupon, it was just in Australia. Yeah. Now everyone knows Groupon's the biggest mm. deal, daily deal site, the fastest growing company in the history of the world. Mm. They're having some problems now, but they hit a billion dollars in sales faster than any other company on the planet within mm. two years. Mm. He said, it works overseas, I'm gonna start a similar thing in Australia, it hasn't been done here before. Uh, I'm raising $5 million for 10%, you know, the company had half a million dollars, you have 10% of the company. And I said, it's a great idea, change this, this and this will work. Mm. And within two years, he took that startup from zero to a $300 million company within mm. two years, sold it to the second largest daily deal site in, in the world, uh, and, and exited in mm. two years. That's an idea that works, someone started with nothing, $300 million company in 24 months. Mm. So can you create wealth at a fast rate in this world? Absolutely, but you have to have a model, mm. uh, something that already works and just make it better. And that's what he did. And also tapping into the internet trend where internet companies uh, are the future. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So uh, Jamie, our viewers would love to know where they can get some of these resources and probably some of the books that have inspired you and changed your life. Yep. What are the top books that have really changed your life? Um, I think Think and Grow Rich uh, mm. is probably an all-time classic that, you know, if you haven't read that book. I remember reading that book and it, my mind changed. time I finished the book, I was a different person. Yeah. Um, so books like that, um, they've made a big difference. I think some of Richard Branson's books are great for entrepreneurs, mm. of course. Um, Total Recall, I'm fortunate I read that recently. Yeah. That uh, definitely, that is probably one of the greatest books I've ever read as far as lessons that you can learn yeah. about what it really takes from, from you know, in, in life. So uh, many books, we give away a, a lot of books I've written in the last two years, books on lessons I've learned from 101 Lessons I've Learned from Richard Branson, mm. Steve mm. Jobs, mm. Uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger just yep. released a book on that, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. So we give these books away as mm. free, free resources to our um, our subscribers, so people go to 20 centuryeducationcom yep. they can download as many of these books and read, uh, join our Book of the Month Club and they yep. can um, get these for free throughout the year and continue reading. Mm. Um, so that's part of our mission to help change Australia is providing financial education resources mm. um, to Australians at, mm. at no cost so they can really uh, just take one idea, as you know, from a book or seminar yeah. uh, can completely change uh, your direction where you're going to be exactly. five, ten years from now. Mm, great, great. Okay, so Jamie, finally, if you lost it all, yeah, touch wood, never happens, <laughs> but if you did, what is the number one strategy or what would you do to regain your wealth the fastest time possible? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. First of all, I think when, if you become wealthy because you change your psychology rather than inherit the money or whatever, you don't have to live in fear of losing your wealth. As long as you have your health, I know that I have the psychology and I have the strategies to recreate wealth. So I don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, no one wants to lose all their wealth, but you can live with a sense of certainty that you can recreate it. Yeah. Uh, I've said to a few people, I would probably, um, 
you know, I'm not sure whether I would start a company on my own again. Of course, I could do that or do that, but that can be quite challenging. Mm. I said a lot of people, what they should do would be much smarter to go and work within a company and industry you believe in, mm. go mm. on as a contractor or consultant basis so you have a bit more freedom, and work within a company. It's easy to take a company that's doing, say, $10 million mm. and turn it into a $100 million company and take a slice of that increase. Yeah. Or take a hundred million dollar company and turn it into half a billion dollar company and take a slice of that increase than it is to start a zero company to get it to 10 million. Yep. I mean, that's the hardest part. Mm. So, if you wanted to create wealth again, that's what I would probably do because it'd be easier just go and help other companies grow rapidly with the knowledge that I've developed and take a slice of that. Mm. Um, I think that is what I would recommend. Anyone can do that. They just got to get the knowledge, which yep. anyone can learn, mm. and then go and apply it and help companies grow. Mm. Great, Jamie. Excellent, excellent information. I'm sure everyone gets, uh, will get a lot of value out of the interview. So thank you very much for uh, chatting with me today. You're welcome. Pleasure.